Let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm recording this on Ascension Thursday, just ten days before Pentecost. This text from Romans chapter 9 really fits well with the theme of Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples and gave them the power to freely talk about Jesus in the midst of the most dangerous place on earth, which was Jerusalem. As we have gone through the book of Revelation of Romans, we have seen that the theme is salvation from sin, death, and the devil through faith in Christ alone. And this teaching fills us sinners with great comfort. For example, last week we were looking at the latter part of chapter 8 where Paul says that Jesus was delivered up for us all. And then he said Jesus died, he was raised, and now intercedes before the Father on our behalf when we sin. It's easy for us to lose sight of this great comfort in the midst of this pandemic where we are required and voluntarily confine ourselves. People are so concerned about staying healthy, about losing their job, of of being swept away by the financial crisis and really about avoiding people at all costs. And it really works contrary to the way God would have things be. God designed that Christians gather together to encourage each other in the Christian faith. And we are to be near people who don't know the Savior so we can share the saving gospel. In today's text, we see a wonderful, wonderful example to us of the Apostle Paul, who is deeply concerned not only of his own salvation, but for the salvation of the lost brethren, his companions in the Jewish nation. A few years ago, there was a Pro, pro Bowl uh, Hall of Famer quarterback by the name of Brett Favre, who played for the Green Bay Packers. When he got to the end of his career, <clears throat> the Packers let him go, and he signed with the Minnesota Vikings, their arch rivals. Many people were very upset with Brett Favre for having left the Packers and gone to their rivals, the Vikings. The Apostle Paul faced a similar situation. He had grown up as a Jew. He had taken a leadership position among the Jews, but then the resurrected Jesus appeared to him and Paul changed his mind completely about Jesus, became a Christian and a missionary of the gospel. Many Jews were very upset with him. They wanted to throw him in jail and to kill him. What would Paul think of his former comrades in his race and religion? Now, it, as Paul talked about salvation by faith in Christ alone or justification by faith, it became reasonable for him to bring up the subject of his Jewish uh, family, his Jewish comrades. What about their salvation? Paul, because he had been rejected by the Jews, could easily have grown resentful and held a grudge and said, I, I don't want to see these people be saved. But that's not the way it was at all, as you'll see in this text. And my hope and prayer for today's study of this text is that we would gain a heart that Paul had for the Jewish people and for all people who don't know the Savior. The salvation of the Jews was a great concern to the Apostle Paul. Now remember something that Paul had just concluded this wonderful, amazing speech, one of the most majestic speeches in history, claiming that nothing is able to separate us from the love of Christ, not death, nor life, not height, nor depths, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ. And from that mountain height and with on, within only seconds. But keep in mind that there were no chapter and verse divisions in the letters of Paul. We put them in later. So just moments after reaching these great heights of talking about the love of Christ, 
Paul falls into the depths of sadness. He says, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bearing witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ, for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He had just gotten done praising the love of Christ that conquers all, but in a moment he traveled from the heights of joy to the depths of grief, and his shift in emotions was dramatic. And that's how things are for Christians many times. We rejoice over the wonderful things God has and is doing for us, and then moments later we see the fallenness of our world and the problems that loved ones have in their lives and our own, and we sink into great de uh, uh, grief. And that's our everyday experience. Now, Paul had no ill will toward the Jewish people, and he assured us of this when he said, I am telling the truth in Christ. To emphasize this, he added, I am not lying. And if that were not enough, he then went on and said, my conscience also is bearing witness in the Holy Spirit who guided his words. Notice how Paul so often says that he is in Christ. The fact that he knew Christ as a Savior had changed his life. It changed the way he talked. It changed his behavior. How about for you, too? Do you live your life and speak the words that you say because you know Jesus Christ? You are in Christ. He says, because I know Christ, I'm telling you the truth. And I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. Great sorrow and grief that just went on day after day, he felt this burden for his comrades in the Jewish faith. My burden, he said, is for my kinsmen according to the flesh. For I wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. The horrible truth that Paul was living with was that his fellow Jews were still under the curse. They didn't know the Savior. They were separated from Christ and eternal salvation. And what Paul wished, if he could get his wish, is that he could take their place, that he would be cursed by God instead of them being cursed, that he could be separated from Christ rather than they being separated from Christ. Could you would you ever say such a thing about someone else? Would you, if possible, exchange your eternal salvation for someone else's damnation? The prophet Moses came close by this demonstration of love that he had for the children of Israel. The children of Israel had grievously sinned against God by worshiping a golden calf. And Moses said to God, Alas, this people has committed a great sin, and they have made a god of gold for themselves. But now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, please blot me out from thy book which thou hast written. When you think of that, and Moses' great love for the Israelites, and now Paul's great love, willing to take their place under God's condemnation, doesn't your admiration for Paul just rise to the top? It's amazing that he had this deep love for his fellow Jews. And it causes us to ask questions of ourselves. To what degree and what lengths are we willing to go to bring the gospel to the people of our country and community, our neighbors and our relatives? And what attempts and what sacrifices have we made on their behalf? Do we have the same love for the lost as the Apostle Paul here demonstrates? However, this love that Paul had for the Israelites doesn't even compare with the love that Christ had for them. Christ had taken the curse due to them and to us upon himself. 
He suffered and died on the cross in our place and then rose from the dead. Paul had said while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. So the matter of the salvation of the Jews was a, a deep, deep concern, a great burden that Paul had, but it was also a great concern that God had. Paul had called the Jews my brethren and my kinsmen, but God had his own names and his own description of the Jewish people. And so Paul goes over all of the advantages that the Jewish people had in a, a list of nine things, how God had so graciously watched over them and, and prepared salvation for them. Here is the list. He says, these are the Israelites. That was a most honorable name. We had the first patriarch of Abraham about 2,000 years before Jesus to whom uh, God had given the promise that the Savior would be born from his descendants, his son Isaac, and then his son Jacob. And Jacob once in the nighttime wrestled with God in human form. And at the end of that wrestling match, God renamed Jacob Israel, meaning he who strives with God. And ever since that time, Israel became a noble name for the Jews. Secondly, to whom belong the adoption as sons. God considered Israel as if the nation were his son. For example, in Exodus 22, God told Moses to speak to Pharaoh and say, Israel is my son my firstborn, so precious were they. To whom belongs the glory? We remember that God's glory led the Israelites through the wilderness to Mount Sinai. Uh, it was in the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And it hovered over the tabernacle, the holy tent of worship in the wilderness. God was present with his people to whom belongs the covenants, agreements God made with his people that he would be their God and he would bless them. To these people, God gave the law, the Ten Commandments, which showed the Israelites how they ought to live. Six, they had the temple service, Paul says. The exacting details of the shape and size of the tabernacle, the movable tent of worship, and later on the permanent temple in Jerusalem. There were also very specific prerequisites for the priests and the Levites and the many animal sacrifices that pointed forward to the birth and the suffering and death of our Lord Jesus. Eight, whose are the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, through whom the Savior of the world would be born. It isn't until the ninth and the tenth thing that Paul mentions where we get to the supreme blessing and advantage of the Jews. And from whom these Israelites is the Christ, according to the flesh, received his human nature through the Israelites, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. So the Savior would be born from the Jews, his human nature, and yet he was the mighty God who is over all. This is the unanimous teaching of the scriptures. In the Old Testament, Isaiah calls the Messiah the mighty God. Jeremiah calls him the Lord. The angels in Bethlehem called him the Savior, who is Christ the Lord. The disciple Thomas called him my Lord and my God, referring to Jesus the Apostle Paul wrote, this is the true God and eternal life. And Acts 20, 28 tells us the significance or the importance of why the Savior had to be God and man. Paul instructed the pastors to shepherd the church of God, which he, God, purchased with his own blood. 
It wasn't the blood of just a man, but it was the blood of the God-man who died on the cross to free us from our sins. Martin Luther wrote this, There is nothing which can reconcile God but this inestimable, infinite treasure, even the death and blood of his Son, one drop whereof is more precious than the whole world. When Paul was stating that his own deep wish for the salvation of his countrymen, uh, he was also stating or simply reflecting God's own deep concern for the Jews. Oh, that we might share this same concern for the lost around us. If we could only, after reading this text, catch a little bit more of that fervent, loving heart of Paul for those who don't know the Savior, for those who remain under the curse. It was something that concerned Paul. The salvation of the Jews concerned God, obviously, but what about the Jewish people themselves? They were not concerned about salvation in Christ. In fact, they had rejected the salvation Many, many of the Jews did not believe in him. And when we look at all the advantages we just went through that the Jews had, and, and so many of these things pointed forward to the coming of Jesus as the Savior, and the question had to come up, well, why? Why did so many of the Jews not believe in him? Perhaps some thought, well, maybe the word of God failed these Jews. Well, Paul wrote, but it is not as though the word of God has failed. The problem was not with God, nor his word. The problem was that many of the Jews banked on the idea that they were saved because they were descendants of Abraham. They were blood relatives of his. Paul refuted this idea by saying, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Neither are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac, your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh, simply by birth, who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is a word of promise, at this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. Not all who descend physically from Abraham belong to the true Israel. The children of God are not the descendants of Abraham by natural birth, but those who have the faith that Abraham had. Going back to chapter 4 where Abraham was discussed, Abraham had faith in God's promise of the Savior to come and that promise was fulfilled in Jesus. So the true Israelites are Jews and Gentiles, Jews and non-Jews who believe God's promise, who receive the forgiveness of sins by faith in Jesus Christ. Paul goes back into the history of the book of Genesis to show that God saves by means of his promise and not by natural birth. First, Paul went back to Genesis 21 and repeated the words God said to Abraham, through Isaac, your descendants shall be named. God's promise to Abraham was that his son Isaac would be the forefather of the Savior. That was the first historical event Paul pointed to in the book of Genesis to show that God saves by way of promise, not by earthly physical descendancy. He gave a second illustration also from Genesis chapter 18 where God said to Abraham when he was 99 years old and his wife Sarah was 89 years old, God said, at this time next year, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. 
God's promise was simple and amazing, and it was to be believed. So God's promise was being traced through the human ancestry of Abraham and Isaac and then Jacob. Abraham and his wife Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, and uh, Jacob and Rachel. So there's a third historical event that Paul refers to. And he says not only this, but there was also Rebekah, Isaac's wife. When she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac, for though the twins were not yet born, and had not done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose according to his choice might stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to her, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. God's plan for our salvation was not based on physical birth, nor on birth order, because Esau was a few seconds older than Jacob, nor had God chosen Jacob as the ancestor of the Messiah because of his good works, or rejected him because of evil works. It had nothing to do with Jacob's works. Everything was done according to God's free and gracious gift and his promise. The Jews were simply to believe God's promise and be saved by faith in that promise of the Savior to come. Oh, that we would share this deep love that Paul had for the lost. Oh, that God the Holy Spirit would create in us this concern for them. How we must repent because we often fall far short. How we must thank God that through Christ this sin of ours has been forgiven. Do you see the connection now between chapter 8 of Romans and these verses in chapter 9? We rejoice that nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ. And now that joy should move us to pray for the lost, to learn how better to share our faith in Christ with others, and find opportunities to do it. For Paul, these weren't just words that said, oh, I love these Jewish comrades of mine. No, his whole life was an exhibition and a carrying out of that longing in his heart. For everywhere Paul went, <clears throat> excuse me, he first went and shared the gospel with the Jewish community before he went on and preached to the Gentiles. May God fill our hearts with this great joy of knowing our Savior and fill us with great concern carried out into actions to bring the gospel to those who are lost around us. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we repent that so often we're so concerned about ourselves, about this earthly life, about staying healthy during the coronavirus outbreak, about our jobs, and all other kinds of concerns that we forget that the great concern and the most important concern is for our eternal salvation and the eternal salvation of those around us. O oh Lord, give us the strength and courage and the desire and the love for the lost that we would take opportunities and make opportunities to share the saving gospel with others. We pray this in Jesus' name who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen.